special video preview of the Bob Thurman podcast, Planetary Treason, Tibetan Plateau as Global Standing Rock. Now, good morning again, all you jolly opioid lovers who found things being so unbearable that you turned to the poppy, dreams of the poppy, in the very strange uh, forms that they're delivered to you now by the pharmaceutical industry, actually, and by doctors, by this, by a corrupted and messed up system. And uh, I'm totally sympathetic with you. I'm very sorry for you. And also, by the way, this is not the first opioid epidemic. The white, the Euro-American white, or rather I like to call us pink people, and I confess to being one of them, but I don't agree with that policy. But for a long time, even all this war on drugs and everything, we have somehow, with all of our billions of dollars given to the Drug Enforcement Agency, we've not been able to keep the heroin out of the hands of people. So we're there just following in the British system in China that they did in the 19th century, where they used opium as a way of addicting an alienated population and one that was too poor they didn't want to take care of. And basically, it's, kind, it's a kind of chemical warfare by oligarchic elites against the masses. And it's been practiced against the black people, with, and then crack cocaine was the next one, uh, not allowing them to have reasonably healthy marijuana and forcing crack cocaine down their throats, or alcohol, they're in a fire water, alcohol they use with the Indians. So using uh, chemicals against populations that you're trying to destroy by a certain type of elite is an old strategy. And what is interesting is that now it's gone into the white community, who the oligarchy here, by removing the manufacturing jobs from them, uh, has they've destroyed that class really. They've destroyed the working people. They've destroyed half of the middle class. And, by, and once they're destroyed, then they don't know what to do. So they, so they want to opioid, apiate them, to have them self-destruct. And therefore, they couldn't somehow stop that corporation in Connecticut, the Purdue Corporation, the same as the chicken. <laughs> same name as the chicken thing. They allowed them to like pump out all this ridiculous amount of opioids and then brainwash doctors that though that's helping people with their their body pains etc instead of getting them out into a nice exercise or a yoga program really it's a disgrace perpetrated by the very oligarchy that now has taken over the government and is trying to cut all your medicaid ou people and all your health care in every every state and every place in the in the country like the evil Republican governors who were paid by these, but they're not paid by the Republicans. They're paid by oligarchic anarchists. Libertarians means anarchists, government destroyers, treasonous people, Benedict Arnold's, not conservatives. Get that straight. So they've got you all drugged up. But anyway, I don't want to rail about them. I want to talk to you. There's ways you can deal with this thing. First of all, you shouldn't feel bad. I mean, that's why I went, in, I went in a little bit against the, the bosses. This was inflicted upon you by a corrupt system. And, you know, you don't have to be permanently destroyed by it. Some of you may have wrecked your health by now from, from not eating properly or whatever, being homeless, I don't know, being, you know, exposing yourself while completely passed out or stoned out. You know, you, you, but those of you who maintain some reasonable health, you can recover from opioid, opium addiction. It is very possible. There are definite ways that can very quickly cure you from that. The best is ibogaine and MDMA and psilocybin. These are the, these are the best. These were ones that the, the evil oligarchs may outlawed with their fake war on drugs. You know, these are, these are entheogenic compounds. They're vision quest compounds. They're used in tribal societies to give people a sense of meaningfulness in life, to allow their consciousness to awaken 
they're not addictive because they're they're heightened awareness rather than dull awareness. So therefore, they're a little bit frightening to people, and they need special psychiatric or you know curandero shamanistic application to for people in more sane societies than ours has become less sane. So there's lots of things you can do. You can improve your health a lot. You can change your diet. Don't eat junk food. Don't buy, don't eat white flour. Don't eat white rice. Uh, don't eat too much meat, especially hormone and uh, growth hormone injected uh, and, and, and antibiotic injected meat. Don't eat that. And, uh, you know, kill it yourself if you have to eat meat. You know, clean it and, and raise it clean and kill it mercifully, you know. And uh, if you, I mean, I'm, I'm best not to do that, become vegan or vegetarian, but if you have to do that, at least make sure it's not poisoning you, which commercial stuff does. And uh, so that's the first step. That will give you more strength in health to be able to try to make the best of your difficult personal, financial, emotional situation. And then second, you, there are ways of weaning yourself off that if you insist and you vote properly and you insist on getting proper health care, which Obamacare, so-called, which is not called, should not have ever been called Obamacare. It should be called the Affordable Health Care, Affordable Care Act, which is what needs to be developed by real conservative Republicans and real Democrats, not by these oligarchs who are trying to destroy health care so they can make more money predating on you. No. Healthcare is a non, it's not supposed to be a money making thing. It's supposed to be a compassionate thing. It's supposed to be an altruistic thing. Yes, there can be money will be given to people who, by, to healers who will heal people, the people will gratefully give them money. So it will still be a prospering business or profession or calling. But as of basically being the mode of money making, that's no good. That's what's the ruin of the system. That's, that should not be its basic purpose at all. And so, uh, because that healing is a is a is one of humanity's great compassionate activities, and doctors who people are called to that profession are great people, but they become they tend to be corrupted, and maybe some corrupt people are attracted, even unfortunately. So. Then there are alternative and complementary medical traditions. There's acupuncture, there's herbal medical traditions, Western ones, there's Asian ones, Ayurveda, Tibetan medicine, uh, there are, Chinese has Chinese herbal medicine, there, there are your vitamin store, you know, your health store, local health stores, they have things of the, from these kind of traditions. The vitamin things are very valuable. The herbal extracts that they have are very helpful to you, can help you deal with these things. When you, you get off a high level of addiction, you need uh, you need um, gradual, you know, uh, cold turkey sort of situations. But and actually, the 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 so-called psychedelic uh, compounds are very valuable with that. In fact, in fact, even after it was all illegal, the great um, Czech doctor Stanislas Graf at Spring Grove, Maryland. For years, he treated with low doses of psychedelics. Uh, he treated many alcoholics and helped them recover. It's very, very available. And apparently, I don't know this particular one, I've never used it, but there's something called Ibogaine from Africa, a root. It's apparently a special virtue in relation to opium because it does something about the nerve endings that are, you know, the excessive nerve endings that your nervous system has created, which then makes pain withdrawal so painful from opium. It actually it plates over those nerves. It has, a, in addition to a consciousness thing, where you see the whole addiction process in your mind and you are strengthened to, to overwhelm it, to, to cope with it. Uh, also, it actually has a chemical effect on the nerve endings that, that, that tones them down so that your withdrawal is much less painful. So, you know, the fake president is is telling you he cares so much and it's an emergency and everything, but he's put no, not a dime. So you know when he doesn't put money, of course he doesn't like to give any money to anybody else but himself in general, as we see, as, as you should have paid attention to before he was elected. He cheated all his suppliers as a builder and so forth, always, his whole time. But he, so he doesn't like to give money in general, 
And maybe he thinks of the waning amount of money that the government has as he's, his people are destroying it. He wants to get it all himself. I don't know. Certainly he's trying to give himself a Christmas present of a big tax cut, him and McConnell and Ryan, which hopefully we will stop. But um, uh, you, can, you, can, you, you have to step up and do it yourself. You can't wait for him to provide money. You, hopefully there are some Affordable Care Act clinics here and there in good states where the governors accepted the federal grants before this current Congress was able to try to cut them off. And hopefully they still have some of their clinics open and some of the very dedicated people working there who can help you to get over the worst stages of trying to come down off the thing. And certainly they should close down the purveyors and the manufacturers of these opioids. They should certainly make them pick them up with funding by penalties like the tobacco companies had to do for the damage that they caused by overproducing them. The Purdue company, for example, in Connecticut and others. So, and there are others. So anyway, on today, Veterans Day, and then you veterans, you know, I'm very happy that there are generals in the Pentagon who are demanding that the Schedule 1 location of the mind-altering compounds that are used to help overcome post-traumatic stress syndrome and depression and so forth very effectively now in Johns Hopkins in California in various controlled experimental situations for the moment, but should be much more widely available to you. And they're demanding that they become widely available to you because the statistics of success of overcoming these very, very crippling and deadly um, mental state conditions from the very great suffering that you underwent in these wars that you were thrown into by very cynical people without proper, by telling lies actually to everybody about how Saddam Hussein had nuclear weapons or about this and that. You know, trying to occupy different countries which we should not be in the business of doing. It was mis mishandled. It should be the diplom diplomat should be dealing with these kind of people. Not, not, not bombs, which they make money on, by the way. No, it's all money making. It's the worship of money that has ruined this country, you know. So anyway, uh, you know, on Veterans Day, demand yourself, go to California, go to Johns Hopkins, go somewhere and get someone to administer MDMA or psilocybin or something and take a good, in a proper, with proper counseling and take you through the levels of, of stuck memory in your brain of being stuck in this shattering sound or that explosive injury or that terrible thing and demand that you receive that treatment. You can do that. And then, then go outside the ordinary thing to look at so quote unquote complementary medicine in all kinds of dimensions. Learn to meditate, do yoga, demand yoga instruction in the VA hospitals, meditation instruction. Learned without any kind of substance to go into your mind because you, when you go, your consciousness produces substances from your brain and your glands that will give you a good situation, actually. You can learn to do that. Be a warrior inside yourself. You, you've proved already you were a great warrior outside. So you, you have the guts and the gumption and the intelligence to be a great warrior about your insides. And you just have to be given a chance to do it and given the methods that are proven to help you, not ignored, and not given things that don't help you. So, um, I just have a prayer for Tibet today. Om Mani Padme Hum. Everyone should be chanting that. I couldn't afford to, the time or the money to go to Standing Rock personally. I, a lot of my friends went. I applaud everyone who went. I may have a hope chance to go in the future when I am more retired and have more time. I'll try to go. I like to do a sun dance there together with the wonderful Lakota people. And the, or Blackfoot or Crow or whatever. I don't I'm not into their own inner competitions. And um they have natural friendship and brotherhood and sisterhood with Tibetan people. And it's all one, and they and they all have brother sisterhood with all of us. And we're all just, you know, indigenous somewhere on this planet. The only ones who are wrecking it are those who think they're not indigenous. They have multiple passports. 
They live in Shangri-La hotels everywhere. <laughs> they, they don't know the price of grain of rice. They have no idea. They're just into worship of money. They live in a, they live in a, a money sphere rather than an echo sphere. We must be sympathetic with them. We are not against them. We are not. We don't want to harm them. We want to help them. No one is happy if they have many billions of dollars. It's a huge stress. You know, there could be a limit of a billion or something, half a billion, hundred million. You could have a limit. Although if they earn any more, they could have a special directory where they could give. They could be the ones to direct giving it away. They actually do that anyway, but often when they're too old to really do it effectively. It's good when they do it younger and they can be more active and more, more you know, more entrepreneurial in their giving. That's that's the next step actually. That's how we they should be encouraged to be not deprived, not snatched away, not put down, thrown in a heap somewhere, or killed off like the Russian Revolution or the French Revolution. That's no good. They should be in, they're they're skilled people. They are lovely people especially first generation one. And they should be helped to have a more fun time. Genuine fun. Dealing with loving people, not people who are trying to get their stuff away from them. People who like them. That's what they all crave. Right? I'm sitting here in the Catskill Mountains on a beautiful cold day. And I've been reading the a memoir of a wonderful Tibetan Lama called Sogan Rinpoche, who I never met. He's from Amdo, from northeast Tibet, which is now incorporated in China's Qinghai province since the 1950s. And uh, he, he talking about the troubles that he experienced as a youth. He was born in 1964, one year before Tibet was annexed into the, central Tibet was annexed into the People's Republic of China. Well, nine years after his homeland area was annexed into Qinghai province, as the Chinese invaded and Syria gradually annexed different parts of Tibet, the plateau, and finally now, of course, they have annexed all of the plateau. And he was talking about his sufferings, but somehow he managed to develop his spiritual practice all through that. And he never gave up hope, and he does not hate. He's a little, he's very honest and forceful talking about the evil deeds, of such individual Chinese soldiers and the government as a whole, the Communist Party dictatorship as a whole. But he's not, he doesn't have a force of anger about it. He rather likes to talk about the beauty of his grandmother and the, and the sweetness of the Lama with the broken spine in a Chinese reform through education, re-education camp, where his legs had been, been, lower spine had been broken, shattered. But he doesn't dwell on that. He talks about how sweet that Lama was after having escaped, living in a tent somewhere, unable to move, but taken care of by nomads, secretly because at that point it was a, it was a deadly sin to be caught saying, Oh, money, pay me home with your ro rosary in Tibet at that time. But anyway, he gave, gives me great hope and joy and also a great sense of concern about my beloved Tibet, and our beloved Tibet, the world's beloved Tibet. You know, I am the chair of uh, head of the Tibet House, U.S., although my wife really makes it happen, and son, but I somehow have some sort of figurehead status, and like the, being sitting on the prow of a ship, you know, I'm like that. And uh, so I must worry about it. And, you know, since we had this wonderful event recently of the Standing Rock group in the Dakotas where they were trying to preserve the headwaters of the Missouri River and the water of their own cutback reservation. They once were the free range they had of all that area, the great northern steppe, the great northern plain, with they and their buffaloes, you know. And I've always dreamed of having, of, of planting, seeding herds of yaks there actually. Some wild yaks like the wild or like the wild buffaloes, and some domesticated ones, which could go better in a situation where it's not wide, it won't be completely wide open range again, and the yaks can, and then the 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 nomad the nomadism with the yaks could be somehow 
a little bit grafted in with the, with the Plains Indian culture and they could be, have a new livelihood on their reservations since they have a taboo about plowing, you know, and they can't become farmers. And also that area is not suited for that. It's a windy, high, wind swept. It's a grazing area, you know. So anyway, I had that fan I've had that fantasy for ages. And I think I hope to see it happen someday. And be a link between the the sacred mountains of the Lakota people and the sacred Himalayas of the Asian people. And it's, it's one there are two great standing rocks, let's say, in the on the two on our continent, and not to mention the continental divide and the Ute Indians and all of that. We really need a new not a, embracing not only our Latinos and not only our blacks, but also our native our reds, our native friends, so that we have the four the four tribes in a way or five tribes. Then we would have the five tribes. We would have we would have us and we. I don't call us the whites. We are the pinks. Blotchy pink is what the white people are. So the pinks, the blacks, the browns, the reds, and the yellows. I don't know if there's, I don't know any greens. It's too bad. The, the, the dolphins are the blues and the greens. But we need a few more colors. But then we have those, then, then America will be really, it will realize itself when all of these are equal. All of these are brothers and sisters. It will really be wonderful. And we will be natural brothers and sisters with everyone on the entire planet. And it will be really wonderful. And it's coming soon, I do think. I really do. And I know it looks really awful right now. And, um, and I'm, I lose sleep about it, actually. And it's, but, but I believe this will be the case. In any case, I want to think about Tibet with you and about how it is something like a 60 year long standing rock. And the whole connection of rock and water, you know, and the elements in Chinese and Tibetan culture, there's this system of five elements, which are earth, wood, uh, water, you know, fire, rock, or metal or rock, and water. And they go in a cycle like that. There's five of them. And you know, like earth is the mother of wood. Wood is the mother of fire. Fire is the mother of iron, uh, for, you know, taking rock, making iron rock, dealing with rock. And then interestingly, rock is the mother of water. So standing rock has a beautiful idea in that they're water keepers and water preservers and somehow the water comes from the rock. From the and rock metal also comes from metal is just kind of like hard water, and when it's really hot enough, it's it's fluid. It's interesting. So it's a beautiful thing, and and the Tibetans have a total interest in seeing the standing rock prevail, and getting us past this uh, oil, petroleum, militarized, consumerized, petroleumized culture which has ruined our agriculture and it's ruined our communication systems and it's ruining our atmosphere and it ruins our water and it, it creates all these chemicals that are poisoning our food and everything. And we have to get past that system with which we are self-destroying ourselves as human beings. It gives some sort of bursts of growth. It seems to be very prospering and wonderful, but actually it's a long-term effect. It's self-destructive. It's a kind of cancer, actually, the petroleum industry. Cancer, you realize, is a very prosperous tissue. When you get a tumor, it grows like mad and it's uncontrolled. And it's really, it's a, it's a, if it's growth that you want, it's very prosperous. But unfortunately, it's a kind of growth that destroys the host where it grows. And the petroleum industry and culture, the whole petroleum culture, is a cancerous growth that is destroying its host, which is the earth, water, fire, wind, air of the planet, of the whole planet is being destroyed. And so we have to, so standing rock, standing Himalayas, standing Swiss, Mont Blanc, standing Kilimanjaro, standing Andes, standing Rockies, all these mountains are the source of the water. 
they catch the clouds and then the water drips down from the mountain, from the rocks. So the standing rock is what we need to pay attention to. And they are all interconnected. Tibet, what's interesting, sort of was the last place where colonialism prevailed. Last major huge giant place was the Tibetan Plateau, roof of the world, three mile average altitude, almost three mile average altitude, and uh, as large as all of the U.S. west of Mississippi, as large as all of Western Europe, as large as the rest of China, now that it's in China, combined. Almost. If China had dropped off Xinjiang and Tibet and Manchuria, T Tibet would have been the same size as China, with one thousandth the number or one ten thousandth the number of people because of the altitude. And the fact that you can't really plow it in broad, just a little bit, some river valleys next to rivers in small areas. But the main acreage, the main square miles can't be plowed because it's a high step. So nomadism and grazing animals or, or browsing animals was the only way people could live there. So otherwise it makes a desert, you know, if you try to plow it. And uh, I want to return to a topic similar to the one I did about the pledge oath of office of a congressman or senator or president, for that matter, in the of the United States constitutional government, and uh, <clears throat> I did that in 2013. I said, <laughs> "Seems like I come up with something like this every four years. <laughs> I have to be more frequent, I think." And I'm just so upset uh, by one trend. I mean, everyone is upset about everything, and um, I'm upset about the one trend in the. Trump government, that every head of almost every agency is a person whose main mission in life is to destroy that agency. Scott Pruitt in the Environmental Protection Agency is the most egregious one, uh, most visible one at the moment, but uh, Rick Perry in the Department of Energy and uh, whoever's in health. <coughs> huge oligarchs like Wilbur Ross in commerce who want to capture all commerce themselves and they don't want the government regulating it, etc. Everything, even Trump himself, takes no notice of the traditions of the presidency and in a way commentators kind of are in a puzzled state saying about how He's, he's weakening the role of the president. He's destroying the presidency. The White House is in disarray. Tillerson, maybe by now, wants to do some diplomacy, but his department has been completely wrecked. And he's allowing that to happen. State Department. Military is okay and getting support uh, for violence, but actually... In a way, they're wrecking themselves because they are no longer under the control of civilians and they're really not trained to solve many kinds of problems and problems that diplomats should be solving, the military wants to get involved in because they are sort of over, out of control, you could say. They are, in, they are controlling the, the pseudo-president. So this makes me think that... Um, we have to go back, and people are not thinking about this. They're normalizing it in a way they feel they have to normalize it, or it's like they hope to withstand it, and um, somehow it just has to go on. It's, it's as if it were part of the democratic process, and maybe it does. But there is a really interesting consideration. When um, Muslim parties in Algeria, Turkey, probably other places that I'm not thinking of, have won democratic elections, or in Egypt recently, but then they do things that show, or they present a plan that shows that they intend to finish off democracy. That is to say, use their status as elected officials to destroy the election process, to institute Sharia law, 
and to <clears throat> become dictators, actually. And therefore, they are using the democratic victory that they had to destroy the democracy. We stood by, cheerleaded, and supported military people who took over those countries and canceled those elections and those governments and um, tried to calm things down until such time as a regular electoral process could be resumed again, which I don't know really where it's happened effectively, actually. And there is a situation like that in Turkey now, but that guy was smart enough, Erdogan, although crazy enough too, in that he's now canceling, he's like been becoming like the Sultan of the Caliph. And um, he's used the AKP victory to cement dictatorial control of Turkey uh, on a sort of Muslim platform. So, sort of Muslim, and he's attacking even his old previous Muslim ally, the Mr. Gulen. So, who oh, may be a somewhat unsavory himself. But anyway, my point is that we have, there are instances where democracy, when used to destroy democracy, is is people step in and they say no and they they cancel that particular kind of result and look and see how it happened and try to re figure out how to restore proper electoral thing now of course that's unheard of and th unthought of in our culture and we shouldn't and i'm not thinking of that i don't think we can do that except through electoral process but the only way we can do it through electoral process is to restore the electoral process while it's happening rather than by can after canceling it. And um, that's not perhaps possible. I wonder if that can be done. But we have to try. And the first way of try thing to do to try is to try to understand how it happened. And here I have, you know, almost, if you haven't read Jane Mayer's book called Dark Money, then you just won't be knowing what's going on. And there's a few other books of that, of that time since that great study of hers a couple of years ago. But that's a really important book because it shows that the people subverting the democracy that we have are non-democrats. They are libertarians. And they're not Republicans either. They're libertarians. They captured the Republican Party during the Obama administration. Uh, their main protagonists were the Koch brothers, joined by the Mercers, the DeVos family, the Prince family, and these kind of super oligarchs who basically don't believe in the government at all. They basically want the government to be so weak that it can't function, then they can be all powerful. They don't have to pay taxes. They don't have to follow EPA environmental rules. They don't have to follow financial rules and disclosures and so on. They can be as rapacious and accu accumulative as they want. And in a way, it destroy, they, they can destroy their own capitalism, which got them to where it is. Because capitalism does not mean robbing everything. It means exchanging something for something, you know. A crime accumulate, of course, and do it more effectively, but not robbing everything. That's, that's piracy, actually not capitalism. So, so how do we fix this system from within the system? We have to understand that the current self-destruction of the U.S. government that is now taking place is the work of libertarians, neither Republicans nor Democrats, people who don't like democracy. Remember the definition of fascism is the unification of the government and the corporations so that the wealthy corporate powers cannot, there's no layer of protection between them and the people and they can predate, uh, you know, uncontrollably to the people, on the people. The government helps them, actually. The government becomes the corporation. They become the government. And that's what we've seen happen here. And, um, so the first thing about that is the libertarians did it. They were hated by Russians who are dictators and prefer dictatorships. There's a struggle in the world between communist China and communist KGB dominated Russia and people like Mugabe and some sort of 
you know, Chavez, other dictators, you know, now, now that Chavez is heir, um, and um, against democracy, actually. In the name of the people, of course, but that's a dictatorship of the proletariat. That's supposed to be in the name of the people, but it's actually a dictatorship. And that always can take place in a country when there's such a chaos that's brought on by libertarians and anarchists. Libertarian is kind of anarchist. That people will tolerate a dictatorship. Okay? So that's the first thing to understand is that it's brought on by libertarians who despise politicians because they feel they can buy and sell them. And the head politician now, the president, is one who despises politicians. He's, that's how he won. By evoking that, it, because of the chaos in the people, by the predation of the, of, the, of the libertarians. You have to understand that. The working people who were voted to blow up everything and put him in, uh, the, one, the unnamed one, uh, were put in that condition by the oligarchs destroying manufacturing and decent jobs in America, moving offshore to where dictatorships were keeping labor very cheap for them, and then re-importing it back. That so-called trade deficit is just re-importing back their own products, at least at first, without having had to pay salaries to produce them. That is entirely their betrayal of their treason against America, those oligarchs, libertarian oligarchs. And then their second treason against America is to finally destroy the country. And in the case of like Americans for tax reform, the target of my previous um, uh, uh, broadcast, please look at, you can look at that and see it where Amer Grover Norquist, Americans for tax reform, pretending to protect the people against the pittance of taxes that we have to pay, we salary paid workers, against, but really he's there defending the very wealthy from the huge amount they have to pay because of their huge income. Whether it's presented as income or stock appreciation or whatever it is, it is income, right? So the, the target is that, you know, and Bernie Sanders had that point, but then again, he doesn't realize that the oligarchs and these wealthy oligarchs, I'm not pr proposing a violent overthrow of them or even hatred of them. They are also prisoners of a spoiled system and spoiled ideology. The ideology of Ayn Rand, oligarchy, and, and libertarianism. You know, Hayek, you know, road to serfdom is precisely, he presented the road to serfdom. He didn't criticize socialism as the road to serfdom. He's, his way of, of libertarianism is the road to socialism indeed. And that has socialism with the dictatorship of a proletariat, which is a fake populist, the ultimate fake populist thing is a communist government or KGB, post-communist KGB, social capitalist government, oligarchy. Those are all the same thing, actually. Some nuance, but basically the same. So now this last election, we are still not that stupid in America. We did elect Hillary Clinton. We did elect George Bush, uh, uh, Al Gore against Bush and Trump. We did. But they stole the election in different ways. And uh, more, more obviously in the case of Trump, actually, more broad, broadly in the case of Trump, because they'd had 16 years to control more states and governorships and state secretaries of state ships who count and manage the voting systems. And also voting machinery, voting, voting, voting technology they managed to do. So therefore, the so-called swing states, they first of all, using idea, they also have, a, in both cases of the 2000 election, 2016 election, they had allies in the Supreme Court. Supreme Court blocked the Florida recount. The Supreme Court, in this case, um, demolished the Voting Rights Act a year or so ahead of the vote. And therefore, all of those Republican state, Republican governored states, and Republican legislature states, they changed rules to disqualify many voters who were poor, minority, black or Latino, uh, and who didn't have uh, bright IDs and all this. So they disqualified hundreds of thousands or over in many, all of the states, I think 28 or 30 states, millions. And then on top of that, some of the votes that were cast with IDs when people had similar names in, in adjacent states or even faraway states, 
they used Chris Kobach's created interstate cross-check computer program to, again, disqualify those votes that had been cast. Again, in the hundreds of thousands, at least, if not millions. And then they won by a small margin of, of less than 100,000 in several important states using the also corrupted um, system of um, electors who are supposed to keep out a crazed the Democrat, a uh, uh, crazed uh, um, uh, demagogue like that. They're supposed to they're supposed to make a judgment and the electoral college and keep them out, even though they won a vote. Certain some states they're supposed to stop them, but of course they are not. That's also corrupted because they just do whatever the whatever the voters say, and they give, but they give a disproportionate power to less populated states and so on. So. We are in a situation where the elections can be stolen and this final theft. Bush then did a lot to destroy the government, but not completely because he came from a group that was used to dominating a government. You know, the Bush CIA kind of family, you know, Richard Helms, Bush, all these kind of characters. And um, they did that. But uh, but uh, so 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 they were then kicked out by the more extreme libertarians who took him brought in Trump. And then he is destroying the government more. It's his main object while he riches himself. That's all he's doing. He's not serving us as the president at all. He's hostile to us, actually. And hostile to the press. I mean, it, it, it's clear. So the party that the... I think there's a chance, though, because it's so blatant and people maybe can sort of at least subliminally be aware of it, even if they sort of feel invested in how they were, and they don't want to admit that they were conned into this. But uh, I think in the electoral system, the margin will be too great for all those different forms of cheating. When the, the middle class, what was left of the middle class, and the pink people, I never call them white, I call our, us, ourselves pink people, and the pink people will even vote against this. And we'll be able to take the house back next year and we'll be able to get the main machinery of government to try to restore it and rebuild it and rebuild the agency executive branch back in 2000. I think quite definitely we will. But we only will if the movement that we make is aware of these things and realizes what kind of battle they're fighting. Therefore, we have to, for example, go after the institution of the Secretary of State and the Democrats have to organize. First of all, they have to get their act together and realize this is not a Boy Scout game of give and take and back and forth and just Wall Street will now pick you and Wall Street will pick them. It's no longer that case. It, you know, it's, a case, it's more Bernie style. You know, and I would like to see Hillary really back Bernie now, which she failed to do in the election. She says, well, I failed to do that. Well, how, why doesn't she do it now? She should. She should really back him. But... Not the little bit of anger that he showed, frightening the wealthy people, that they should try to control. That language and that kind of, you know, the way he used to say, like, tax the rich. The way he would say the word rich. Rich is a great word. We like rich. Rich enough. Not too rich, because that's even a burden on them. But rich enough is good. We don't dislike anybody. It's, a, it's the system has gone out of balance, and we have to fight politically. We have to have the political revolution Bernie talked about. Um, uh, to 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 rebalance it, but we need all the Hillary people, and we need Hillary and Bill to help us do it. We can't just say, "Oh, there are some corrupt people. We don't want the triangulating Democrats." You know, the new Democrats. We don't want them. We have to have them, and therefore we can't just send a lawyer to file a suit in the Ohio or in Wisconsin against Scott Walker or somebody, and think that's going to control that Secretary of State. We have to expose every single Secretary of State. We have to know the name of that Secretary of State. We have to have people patrolling the office of the Secretary of State. We have to have, uh, we have to try to change rules so that there can be a Democrat, so the Secretaries of State can be bipartisan in some way. For example, that's one thing, or just start breathing down their necks in that light. We have to go after Kobach and really expose him. And not act like liberal Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, we're going to do this by doing because we believe in the system. We do, but the system is not functioning. We have to recognize. So we have to reconstruct the system as we go. That's the key, that they don't seem to get, any of them. 
And they, they have to be, activists have to be there in the office for the Secretary of State. You have to examine all those computer things. You have to hire hackers who are really brilliant and genius, and they have to go and figure out how can those things be hacked and really be on not, not every day. It has to be in the news all the time, be in the awareness of the people, the dishonesty of the voting. And we have to get all the poor people and the minorities, like in places like North Carolina and Wisconsin and Ohio, and get them to where they really will be able to make their voices count. Really have to do that. that that's the key thing. Then we have to have a candidate and run an election, yes. And have conventions and election and parties and whatever. Raise money. We have to do all of that, but we have to look at the system too. This is my, my point. Because the system is allowing libertarians to wreck the system. That's what you have to understand. It isn't Republicans. Conservatives, they're not conservatives, they're radicals. Conservatives would be good, they'd be trying to conserve the system. And here I have a little side note, and I think I've gone on too long, but I have a little side note. Senator Corker and Senator Flake, I 100% applaud you for bowing out of dominating things in this self-destruction of the government. But that's not enough. Between now and when you stop running for office, if it's a year and a half, if it's four years, and Ben Nelson, you too, that's three of you, and McCain, really, four of you, if he would join, you should switch to independent right now in your remaining time in the office. What is this carrying a banner for Republicans? These people are not Republicans. Tea Party people are paid, coke funded libertarian, not just Coke, Mercer, Coke, Bannon, these are libertarian, government destroying. You know, Bannon says he's destroying the deep state. He's destroying the state, not just the deep state, the state. He works for the Russians, connected with them. They want to destroy democracy in Europe. They have, they did a little destruction of it in England already, and it's a very, who knows how that will turn out. They've done it in, in, in Hungary. So, already, you know, and that's Putin, that's the KGB. So they're similar, libertarians are similar to these kind of dictatorial oligarchs, fake populists, they're all fake populists. So don't be fooled by them. And you, Flake, uh, if you really meant what you said, Corker, if you mean what you say about this man is demeaning and destroying the office of the presidency, then you should... You can say to your colleagues or your whoever it is that likes you as a Republican, you can say, I'm trying to rebuild the Republican Party. So the first thing we have to do now is they have to be restrained. So I'm shifting to independent now. And I will vote with the Democrats to block the robbery of the tax system, the destruction of the health system, the destruction of the environment, etc. I will do that. A destruction of the media by corrupt FCC. And, and more Fox News and more fake news, the real fake news, which is Fox News, not the real news people. So you, Flake and Corker, why don't you do that? What's stopping you? If you truly disapprove of this and you dissociate yourself from this, you have to do more than that. You have to save us. And you have to do to McConnell what he did to Obama and stop him in his tracks now for the next year. They are robbing a half, one and a half trillion dollars of the futures of the government's money. Grover Norquist says openly that he wants to strangle the government, strangle the baby in the bathtub. That is treason. That is not a political strategy, it is treason. That is sedition, that is radicality. It is not conservatism. And you have said so, and you believe that. And you must act on that. That's my side request to you. I'm sure you might hear it indirectly through somebody, I hope. But I will keep making that request. In fact, I will write your office. Thank you very much. I, I, I would like to continue, but I, I, will, I don't want to ramble. And maybe I should redo this in a shorter format. I probably will. But in the meantime, at least I've done this. I myself am, have not much time because I'm a proletarian, <laughs> a salary person. Okay, thank you very much.
to listen to the full podcast, please visit BobThurman.com or subscribe via your favorite podcasting platform. Thanks for listening and Tashi Delek.